Lord Jesus, it is your power, your work, your preserving us by which we stand. You are our ground of confidence, assurance, security. And for what you have done on our behalf before your Father, we will stand forever. It is you, Lord Jesus, who intercede on our behalf. It is you who purchased us with your own blood. It is you who have made us uncondemnable. And we praise you for these things. In your name, amen. You may be seated. My seven-year-old and my eight-year-old know it. They know the look in their daddy's eye when daddy is lurking behind some corner, prowling about, seeking whom he may devour. Tickles, tackles, they're coming. They also know which sofa is base, and they start to run when they see the gleam in my eye. And they run around, they pretend they don't want to get tackled, they, then they really don't want to get tackled, and they run for base, and they leap onto the couch and scream, base! I don't know about you, I don't know about your life and your experiences. For me, Romans 8 is something like that couch. It's base. Amidst trials and turmoils and difficulties, my own sin, internal corruptions, external difficulties, a broken world, enemies, Romans 8 is base. One commentator said it this way, the Christian is like a storm-tossed sailor who has arrived at his home port and has cast anchor when he comes to Romans 8. This morning, we're going to focus on the first six verses. Let's read it together. God says through the Apostle Paul, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. What we have in Romans 8 is a picture of new life, the Christian life, governed by the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is mentioned 20 times in Romans chapter 8. He is responsible for the spiritual life of the believer. He creates, sustains, preserves, energizes that new life. The Holy Spirit is the author of the scriptures, 2 Peter 1.21. He is the spirit of wisdom and of knowledge. He is the powerful agent present at the creation of the world. And he is the agent of our regeneration. He lives inside every true Christian. He is the agent of progressive sanctification, that is, your conformity to Jesus Christ, measure by measure. His work is not the sporadic, sensationalized antics of a television healer, but the normal, relentless work of a person inside you, God's spirit of holiness, committed to bringing you into conformity with the character of Jesus we begin to look at this life-transforming work of the Spirit of God this morning here in the first six verses of Romans 8. And we're going to see on display here that the true Christian life lived in the Spirit of God is characterized by four realities. Four realities. The first reality is a new status. It's what we looked at last week, Romans 8.1. The Christian, the one who is in Christ Jesus, is uncondemnable, uncondemnable. 
the ground of this uncondemnable status is the book of Romans up to this point. It is the doctrine of justification by faith alone in the finished work of Christ alone. If Jesus Christ has satisfied the wrath of God, then there is no wrath left. And therefore, the Christian is uncondemnable. This is what we looked at last week. And it's as true this week as it was last week for all who are in Christ Jesus. It will be true for all time for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the first reality. The second reality of the Christian life, a life in the Spirit, is found in verse 2. It is a new governance. A new governance. That is a new governing principle. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. Now, we're going to take apart the pieces of this verse so that we understand what Paul is getting at. The first word is simply for. A subordinating conjunction. It's connecting what verse 2 is saying to what was said in verse 1. But it is not giving us the reason for our uncondemnable status. The law of the spirit of life, having set you free from the law of sin and of death, is not the reason you are not condemnable. The reason you're not condemnable is because of Jesus' work at the cross. That is the argument of the book of Romans up to 8.1. That is the reason and the ground. And in 8.1, we see the word therefore. The therefore in 8.1 connects us to everything that went before. He's not now replacing the doctrine of justification as the ground of your uncannibable status with something else that is a new governing principle in your life. In other words, he's not saying you're not condemnable because something new is governing your life. Rather, verse 2 is giving us the demonstration that you're not condemnable. How do I know I'm in this uncondemnable status? How do I know the doctrine of justification is true of me? And that's found in verse 2, the demonstration of a new governing principle in your life. We could illustrate it this way. Does that car have gas in the tank? Why, yes, it's moving. The fact that the car is moving is not the reason that gas is in the tank. The reason the gas is in the tank is because you pulled up the gas station, put the nozzle in, and dispensed gasoline into the tank of the car. That's the reason there's gas in the tank. But you can say, that car has gas in it, it's moving. The fact that the car is moving is the demonstration that, yes, there is gas in the tank. Similarly, we would say, is that person uncondemnable? Yes, He's been set free from the law of sin and of death. He is under a new governing principle, a new operating principle, a person. The Holy Spirit is in him. A new governing principle is not the reason you're not condemned. It is the demonstration that you're not condemned. Does that make sense? And notice how Paul draws out this demonstration. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. The word law here does not mean the law of God. It does not mean a a set of rules. It does not mean Mosaic law. It is, in fact, a governing principle. It's like the law of gravity. It's a law that operates, that governs the things under which it is. Back up to chapter 7, verse 25, we see the same usage of the word law at the end of verse 25, at the very end of Romans chapter 7. Paul says that when he was in the flesh, he served the law of sin. The law of sin. Law there is not Mosaic law, and it's not a set of rules, and it certainly isn't the law of God. It's a governing principle. A tyranny, if you will. Here, the law is a new law, a new governance, and specifically a person. And this person is the Holy Spirit. This is what Paul draws out in the rest of Romans chapter 8. Look down at verse 6. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. And your English translations capitalize spirit, indicating this is the Holy Spirit. I believe that's correct. Look down at verse 11. Verse 11. 
If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. See there very clearly Paul is talking about the Holy Spirit indwelling believers. And the Holy Spirit indwelling believers is a new jurisdiction. It's a new governance. There is new management. The old management was the law of sin. And the law of the spirit of life has set you free, Paul says in verse 2. That is an objective reality. A one-time event. It happened the day you were born again. It happened the day you were justified. It happened the day that you were forgiven and adopted and regenerated. It is true for all Christians. You've been set free from the law of sin and death, that operating principle under which you lived and walked. You were helpless as a slave of sin, Romans chapter 6, and as one under law, Romans chapter 7. This new jurisdiction, this new management is what Paul was getting at in chapter 7, verses 4 to 6, as a preview of Romans chapter 8. There he says, therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions, which were aroused by law, were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we now serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. Romans 7, 4 to 6 is a preview of what Paul expands on in Romans chapter 8, this new governance, life in the spirit. This is a transfer of realms being described here, a transfer of jurisdictions. You were under the reign of sin, under the tyranny of law, and under the governance of death. And now you have been transferred from that realm into another realm. You are under new management. This is what Paul calls at the end of Romans chapter 5, the reign of grace. The second reality that characterizes life in the spirit is this new governance. It's an objective reality. It is true of every Christian. And the third reality that characterizes life in the spirit is found in verses 3 and 4. And it is a new record. A new record. Read with me. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Remarkable statement. A remarkable statement of your new record before God. Prior to the transfer from one realm to the other, you had a long list of crimes committed against your maker. Foul motives, evil thoughts, careless words, wicked deeds. And even the best of what we had to offer were, as Isaiah says, filthy rags before him. But for all who are in Christ, something new comes about. It sins forgiven. God's demands fulfilled. And listen, as long as we were reckoned lawbreakers... We could never bear fruit for God. We could never please God. In fact, Romans 6 verse 20 tells us we were free in regards to righteousness. Righteousness had no claim on the life of one who was under the reign of sin. And the outcome of that kind of life was only shameful things and death. But as soon as we were justified, declared righteous, as soon as we were declared by God law fulfillers, we were transferred from the dominion of sin to the dominion of grace. We were out from under the law of sin, the operating principle, the governance of sin, verse 25 of chapter 7, and we were out from under the law of God. 
Paul tells us we needed to be out from under law and out from under sin in order to bear fruit for God, in order to be pleasing to him. How does this new record come about? This is what verse 3 explains for us. For what the law could not do, for what the law could not do. And I think Paul here is dealing with law in principle in general, and he has God's law in view primarily, and I think he probably has God's law expressed in the law of Moses in view particularly as the greatest example of God's law available to his readers and to himself in this time. What they were accustomed to reading, what they knew about, what they esteemed, what they memorized, what they sought to follow. Paul says, the law could not do. You see, the law demanded a life of holiness, but only only the gospel could credit a life of holiness, and only the Holy Spirit could produce a life of holiness. The law couldn't count a lawbreaker as a law fulfiller. The law can't do that. And the law can't produce law-keeping in a sinner. Notice why Paul says this, weak as it was through the flesh. Weak as the law was through the flesh. Weak as the very law of God was through the flesh. You're telling me the law of God is weak? (laughs) Well, it's weak to accomplish what the sinner most desperately needs. And the problem is not the law. Again, the problem is the sinner. Because of sin, the law could only increase our guilt, magnify our transgressions, even provoke in us more sinning. The sign on the lawn, the the newly planted grass, the sign says, keep off the grass. It's a beautiful sign, well-constructed. The the author's intent in the sign is clearly conveyed. And what does that sign make you want to do? You know it. Jump on the grass. Transgress that barrier. Maybe even roll around in it. And then, then that sign is staring at you. The sign that said so clearly, so plainly, so beautifully, keep off the grass. Now it's like Edgar Allan Poe's telltale heart, and it's haunting you. And what do you do with that sign? You pull it out of the ground, snap the post, and stomp on the sign. You, now you hate it, because it only condemns you. There was never anything wrong with the sign. The problem is with the sinner. The law demands righteousness, but cannot produce it, provide it, or procure it. God's law defines, exposes, provokes, and condemns sin. But it cannot free the sinner from the presence of sin. Cannot liberate the sinner from the slavery of sin. It cannot deliver the sinner from the guilt of transgressing the law. It's not because the law is bad, but because the combination of a righteous standard as the governor over a slave of sin is a deadly combination. Gravity is good. It's a good law. Can you imagine what it would be like without the law of gravity? Oh, that'd be awesome. You'd think for about five seconds. <laughs> gravity is good. But a man left alone at 30,000 feet is dead. The law of God and a sinner under it is a bad combination. What the law was powerless to do, weak as it was through the flesh. Notice the next phrase, God did, verse 3. And the original, the, the subject is God, and the verb doesn't come all the way until the word condemned at the end of the verse. God condemned sin in the flesh. That's the whole idea. The English translation just says God did, and then it fills in the rest of what it is that God did. What the law was powerless to do, God did. And it's a simple statement that just declares for us that salvation is all of God. There's not a partnership, a synergy here. God did what was required. 
The sinner didn't need just a little help. The sinner didn't need assistance. The sinner didn't need a safety rope to grab onto. The sinner didn't need a parachute. The sinner needed God to do everything that was required for his salvation. And God did everything that was required for his salvation. What the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. When Paul gets to the end of his exposition of the gospel at the end of Romans 11, he will say, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. That's true here. God did it. How did God do it? The next phrase gives us the instrument of God's doing what only he could do, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. How did God condemn sin in the flesh? He sent Jesus. He sent his own son. There's a sense in which all of humanity, because God's the creator and we're all dependent on him, there's a sense in which all of humanity, sons and daughters of God. Paul makes that clear in Acts 17. There's another sense in which rebellious humanity is not sons and daughters of God, but actually children of the snake. And you don't get to be in relational sweetness of a father-son, father-daughter relationship with God any way but through the gospel and by adoption. And we are separated from him naturally in our sin. But when God talks about sending his own son, notice the uniqueness of this phrase. Jesus is not like us. Hey, we're all sons of God. All us Christians are sons and daughters of God, and Jesus is one like, no, he is totally different. And, and God sent his own son. This is a phrase that marks out Jesus' uniqueness. He is a son to his father in a different way. He is God the son. He is God the Son. He is 100% God and he is related to the first person of the Trinity as Son. And God sent his own Son. Shocking statement. The fact that God had to send the Son of his love, his only begotten, the beloved Son, the fact that the second person of the Trinity had to come to earth to solve this problem, indicates the depth of our problem and the depth of our helplessness. Listen, if, if Jesus himself had to come to the earth to solve our dilemma, this was not a problem you could solve yourself. You could not by any religion, any works, any merit, any rectifying your situation, extricate yourself from your own lostness and spiritual deadness. Only Jesus could do this. God did what the law could not do, weak as it was through our sin, by sending his own son. And how did he send him? Notice verse 3, in the likeness of sinful flesh. And Paul is very careful with his words here. If he had merely said, in the likeness of flesh, we would be tempted to think that Jesus wasn't a real human he only looked like he had a body. It was the likeness of flesh. That is actually the ancient heresy of docetism. That is that Jesus was just a phantom, that his physical body was just a, a, the mere appearance of a physical body. No, the truth is, he was a real human. And if Paul had said that Jesus came in the flesh, it, it would not have communicated Jesus' affiliation with sin that was the purpose for Jesus' coming. And if Paul had said he came in sinful flesh, well, that would have let us believe that Jesus was a sinner. The wording is very careful here. You know our phrase, to err is human. It's not actually true. It just happens to be true for all of us, for almost all of human history so far. Right? Every human you've ever known uh, sinned, erred. But it wasn't true of Adam. It wasn't true of Jesus. For a, it wasn't true of Adam for a time, however long that was, in the garden. It wasn't true of Jesus. He was fully human and he did not sin. And it won't be true of you in the eternal state, Christian. 
you will not sin. It will not be true to say to err is human. In fact, you will have lived very soon much longer not sinning than you have already accumulated in your time sinning so far. But we're so accustomed to thinking of human nature as a sinful nature that we almost are tempted to think that sin is intrinsic to humanity. And it's not. It's not the definition of what a human is. It just happens to be the prevalent condition we're all in currently. So for Jesus to come in the likeness of sinful flesh, and the word likeness is used similarly in a couple other points in Romans up to this point, to, to show a similarity with a difference. A similarity with a difference. And, and there's a slight difference here. There's a closeness, but this is not identical. One commentator said it this way, God sent his son in that nature which in us is identified with sin. The son of God came as a real man in real flesh to be intimately involved with our sin, but he himself was without sin. Consider the ways that God the son experienced an intimacy with human sin while never sinning himself. In the incarnation, the enfleshment of the Son of God, beginning at Bethlehem, Jesus experienced the effects of the fall. A cursed world, broken world, cursed work, sickness, weakness, fatigue, hunger, thirst, sadness. Jesus was also sinned against by sinners. Jesus is the one who hates sin, can't tolerate sin, and yet tolerated sin. The sins against him by sinners culminated in his rejection, crucifixion. He was mocked, beaten, spat upon, whipped, falsely accused, and ultimately tortuously murdered. Consider Jesus' affiliation with sinners. At his baptism by John the Baptist, the, the, the mere fact that Jesus was in bodily form and came to the earth and dwelt among us, John 1.14, is significant. Rubbed shoulders with the likes of us. But then at the baptism of John the Baptist, he enters into the waters that John was calling people to repent of their sins and prepare the way for Messiah. And Jesus enters the waters, the, the dirty waters that deal with us needing to turn from who we are and what we do. Jesus entered to affiliate himself with sinners. Not because he was a sinner, but because he was willing to get close to us. Luke 23 tells us that uh, the whole genealogy of Jesus, where did he descend from? Luke 3.23 says, as was supposed, he was the son of Joseph. In other words, if you were to ask the, the common people, who is Jesus? Oh, yes, he's the son of Joseph. They were wrong, but that's what was understood. Everyone would have just assumed that he is just like us. He lives and breathes and eats and works, and I know what I'm like, and I project what I'm like onto him because he looks like me. He was in the likeness of sinful flesh. Jesus also experienced temptation. Though he was unable to sin, he experienced real temptation. Hebrews 4.15 says this, The one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. And of course, Jesus' intimate interaction with sin meant that he experienced death. He experienced death. Finally, and most awfully, Jesus experienced an intimacy with sin by becoming sin on our behalf. You know 2 Corinthians 5.21, God caused Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. Paul goes on and says, that he came not only in the likeness of sinful flesh, but also as an offering for sin. 
as an offering for sin. The original literally just says, and he came concerning sin. But I believe the New American Standard Bible has it right in inserting the words as an offering for sin. The simple word for sin in the Old Testament was used interchangeably for the sin committed as well as the offering made as a substitute sacrifice for that sin. I'll give you an example in Leviticus 4.3, but it's all over the Old Testament. If the anointed priest sins so as to bring guilt on the people, then let him offer to the Lord a bull without defect as a sin offering for the sin he has committed. The sin offering and sin are the same single word in the Hebrew. And it was used interchangeably, not only for the, the crime against God, but also the offering for that crime. Isaiah 53.10 talks about Jesus rendering himself as a guilt offering. Why did God send the Son to, in the likeness of sinful flesh, to be a sin offering? That is, a substitute, an innocent substitute for the sinner in the place of the sinner to pay for those sins. That is why He came. And God, in sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, God did what the law could not do. What is it that the law could not do that God did? He condemned sin in the flesh so that the law's demands might be fulfilled in us. First of all, he condemned sin in the flesh. In the flesh simply just means in Jesus' flesh, in, in Jesus' body. God condemned sin in Jesus' bodily. Jesus' body was the place where sin was condemned. He was a real human to suffer the punishment due to real human sin. Listen to this song penned by Isaiah that one day I believe Israel, when Israel repents, will sing of their Messiah that Jesus was stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. And the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. This is what Isaiah said Messiah would do. This is what Jesus said he would come to do, to lay down his life for his sheep. And this is what Paul says God sent the Son to do. God the Son bore our sins, bore our transgressions, bore our iniquities. God the Father condemned those sins bodily. He struck, smote, afflicted, chastened, scourged, crushed His beloved Son in our place. And He did all of that for a purpose. That purpose is found in verse 4. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. God crushed his son at the cross, inflicting judicial wrath against Jesus in our place so that, and you have to connect the purpose statement with what went before. This idea of a so that in the Bible can either indicate purpose or result. But when God is the subject of the sentence, the purpose and the result are identical. Why is that? Because God always gets what he wants. He always accomplishes what he sets out to do. And that is true here. The purpose for which God condemned sin in Jesus is that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. And requirement here could rightly be translated as the righteous requirement or the just demand. Demand. 
This is the righteousness demanded by the law. And the way this word is used over and over and over in the Old Testament is this righteous requirement of God. The righteousness the law demands. And notice here it's singular in verse 4. This is the only time it shows up singular. And I think this, this indicates that this is a summary of everything that God demands of his people. And notice in verse 4 that the verb fulfilled is passive. It's passive. That means something is done for you. This is not something you go out and do. Christ did not die on the cross so that you can therefore go out and fulfill all the law's righteous demands. This is a forensic declaration, not an obligation. Do you understand? God did this for us in the gospel. He sent the Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. Don't disconnect these so that the law might be fulfilled in us. God does the fulfilling of the law through his work on Christ at the cross on behalf of those who are in Christ. Now listen, there is an obligation coming. Look down at verse 12. So then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, etc. So there is coming directives about how to live the spirit life, how to live a life characterized by governance of the Holy Spirit. That's coming. But here what's in view in verse 4 is the forensic declaration of what God has accomplished. God condemned his son so that those in him would be considered law fulfillers. He does not mean here that Christian obedience fulfills the law's requirements. Your imperfect obedience in Christ could never do that. It hasn't done it so far. It won't do it tomorrow. In fact, we don't lower the standard of God's righteousness and then equate that with our imperfect obedience and call it fulfillment. The only way the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled is by what God did in Christ for us at the cross. The law demanded perfect obedience, and it demands punishment for disobedience. And what happens at the cross is this glorious exchange. 2 Corinthians 5.21, I read the first half of it earlier. God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that, here's another one of those so that's, we might become the righteousness of God in him. There it is. We, we actually become something by God's forensic declaration, God's very righteousness. There is what we call negative imputation. That is, my sins imputed to Christ. My sins placed on Jesus at the cross and fully punished, and the law demands the punishment. And then there is also positive imputation. That is, Christ's righteousness credited to my account. This is what Paul details for us in Philippians 3.9. He says, may I be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from law, but that righteousness which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. And you see what the law could never do. What could the law never do? Condemn sin in the flesh so that those who are in Christ could be fulfillers of law. Law could never bring about fulfillment of law. But God does in the gospel. God condemned our sin and fulfilled the requirements that the law demanded. How? By sending his son in the flesh, placing our sins upon him, condemning him in our place, Jesus was exchanged for the believer under the wrath of God. He was our substitute. And our crimes were exchanged for his righteousness. And because both sides of the law's righteous demand are met for the one who is in Christ Jesus, God's law has no more claim on that one. Uncondemnable. A new status. Freed by the Spirit. Spirit. 
a new jurisdiction and forgiven and declared righteous, a new record. These things characterize the Christian life, and they all go together. You can't have one without the others. And there is a fourth reality that characterizes everyone in whom the Spirit of God dwells, and it is a new way of life. And like the other three, it goes together. You can't have the first three without the last, and you can't have the last one without the first three. Look what Paul says at the end of verse 4. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. Next week, we're going to focus our attention on the life in the flesh. We're going to contrast life apart from the Spirit, to what we've been looking at this morning in life in the Spirit. But this morning, we're going to single out those details from verse 4, verse 5, verse 6 that describe a Christian's new way of life. What a new life looks like, a life governed by the Holy Spirit, a life under no condemnation, a life with a clean record, and a life with this new governing principle, this person, the Holy Spirit. And while Christian behavior is not the way the law's demands are met, everyone for whom the righteous requirement of God is met experiences a fundamental change of behavior. You don't meet the law's demands by being good. But if God has met those demands for you, He makes you good. Progressively. Bit by bit in the conformity with His Son. This is the work of the Spirit in us. In the gospel is not only forgiveness of sins, a crediting of perfect righteousness, but also the Holy Spirit dwells in the hearts of believers so that they are enabled and energized by Him to walk in obedience to God's demands. Verse 3 and the first half of verse 4 are imputed righteousness. And the second half of verse 4 and the following, the rest of Romans chapter 8, is imparted righteousness. Life transformation by the Spirit of God demonstrates the transfer from one realm to another. You could never bear fruit for God while you were a slave of sin and you were under the tyranny of law. But under the reign of grace indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, the Christian invariably lives differently. A new creation, walking in the good works which God created. New life is evidence of the transfer from the reign of sin to the reign of grace. Under the realm of sin, there was condemnation, enmity with God, slavery to sin, under the tyranny of but without any help from the law, spiritually blind, deaf, and dead. The new realm, the reign of grace, is a realm of no condemnation, peace with God, slaves to a new master, free from the tyranny of sin and the law, spiritually alive, able to see, able to hear. What Paul describes in verses 4, 5, and 6 are a new way of walking, a new way of thinking, and new outcomes. Look at verse 4, a new way of walking. This forensic truth, this thing that God has accomplished in exchanging our sin for Christ's righteousness at the cross produces people who are described at the end of verse 4 as those who walk according, not to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. This is a definition of a Christian, a description of a Christian. What's a Christian? Someone walking according to the Spirit. This is a new way to walk. This is not a command here. There are places where the New Testament commands us to walk according to the Spirit. This is just a description of who you are, Christian. It is produced by the Holy Spirit. It is the fruits of justification realized tangibly in your life. You can taste it and feel it and see it. The forensic declaration becomes evident through real tangible transformation. Transformation. 
you start to walk different. A walk here is just a pattern of living. Paul, to the letter to the Ephesians, describes a way of walking as the Gentiles walked. It just means how you go about carrying on your life. You walk different. Because God has taken you from one realm to the other. Because the spirit of life has made you free. It is a qualitatively Holy Spirit kind of life. He says in verse 5, those who are according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. This is a new way of thinking. To set their minds is to place the seat of all your mental affection and faculty and devotion. To set your minds on the things of the Spirit is to have a totally different paradigm about what you desire, the things you pursue, what you care about, what you aspire after. This is a new bent, a new disposition, a new orientation. You have new thought patterns. You just don't think the way you used to think. And you don't think the way the world thinks now. Something has changed. There is a new way to walk. There is a new way to think. And this new way of life with its new patterns of walking and new patterns of thinking brings about new results. Notice what he says at the end of verse 6. The mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. It's different than you had before. Death and hostility. This new way of life, this new way of walking, this new way of thinking with its new results is a great ground of assurance for Christians. You see these things operating in your life and you say, the Holy Spirit is at work. The Spirit of God indwelling a believer produces these things. This is life in the Spirit. And the one who is experiencing these things has great subjective, personal experience of assurance that I am not under condemnation, that I, in fact, belong to God, that my sins have been forgiven. This is also a great mirror for you this morning if you're here unsure about your state before God. Have you experienced this new life? Has there been a change in in the pattern of your walking? Have there been new patterns of thought and behavior? Has God upended the things that you care about, the things you're consumed by, the things you aspire after? Is there evidence that the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you? Have you experienced... Life and peace. You cannot be a Christian without these things. Forgiveness of sin by the Son of God, adoption by the Father, and life transformation by the Spirit all go together. Next week, we're going to look at the contrast between a life lived in the flesh and a life lived in the Spirit. And that's not a contrast between two kinds of Christians or the way you lived on Monday and the way you lived on Tuesday. No, it is a contrast of two different people in two different realms. A life lived under the tyranny of sin and the law, under the reign of sin, or a life under the reign of grace, indwelt by the Spirit, lived for the glory of God, forgiven uncondemnable, new. Let's pray. God, thank you for your grace and for the reign of your grace brought to us through faith in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You sent him in the likeness of sinful flesh, shocking, and as an offering for sin, horrific so that your law's righteous demands might be met in us who are in him. What a great privilege it is to be in Christ. How blessed we are 
to have heard the gospel and to have had our eyes opened by your kindness and to have believed. We pray this morning for anybody who is here who has not yet experienced life transformation by your spirit. For anyone here who is unsure about their standing before you, may they receive forgiveness of sin, an uncondemnable status, a new record, a new governance, and a new way of life. And, oh God, those who are here this morning who have an interest in you but are not sure, not grounded in assurance, would you be pleased to make the work of your Spirit so evident in their life that they can have renewed confidence in what you have done? Thank you again for this anchor for our souls, this magnificent chapter. May we rest in these truths. May we cling to you in Jesus' name.